Dylan McAdams. Thank you. Yeah, like she said, I'm uh, Dylan McAdams. I am a I'm a longtime uh, TIG resident. I've been from here all my life, born and raised. And at a very young age, I was uh, spending time down here at the depot with my grandfather and uh, working, doing odds and end things. He uh, started the model train layout in the back, and so that's what had my interest, is watching the trains as a kid. You know how that stuff goes. But in the last few years, uh, especially mainly during the winter time when I have the most free time, I find myself spending a lot of time in that depot, especially late at night, just going through through paperwork and other things left behind by the road, going over photographs 10 times, noticing things I didn't notice the last time I looked at it. And there's a lot of magic involved in that building because late at night when you're working in there, I lose track of time, it'll be one in the morning. It still has all the original wooden uh, weighted windows and they have drafts. And so whoever gets superstitious on ghost stories, I'm not, but you know, you get the feeling once the drafts get moving strong enough in that building, the, the windows will start to vibrate a, real, a, a lot. And the panes of glass are so thin, you'll start hearing it knock around some. And then once you finally start getting fatigued enough to look around, you might hear some creaking going on upstairs with the beams popping. And then that's when you say it's time to go home and come back in the morning. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to get started with my slideshow here. And uh, the title of my slideshow is just uh, simple, The Trinity and Brazos Valley Railway, uh, History and uh, Recollections. So we're going to start with just a few quick key points, uh, nothing too detailed, just getting down to the point because we're really going to be deep diving into uh, photographs and other things. And uh, I have a lot of slides, so if anyone wants to ask any questions, has any input, sees some information that might need touched up a little bit, please tell me because I'm going to keep this slideshow and edit it over the years for future purposes if I need to use it. So starting off, the Trinity and Brazos Valley Railroad was chartered on October the 7th, 1902. The vision was to build a railroad from Johnson County to the Beaumont area. The first segment of the TNBV opened between Hillsborough and Mahia in October of 1903. Cleburne was served by the TNBV in 1904 and trackage at this point was 78 miles. And uh, here is a very early map showing uh, the TMBV system when the, they only had trackage from Cleburne to Mahia, and it shows the vision that they had to reach Beaumont at the time because of Spindletop and the prosperity going on in that area, but also wanting to reach Houston. So if you'll notice here, this is at the time the existing trackage, and uh, Mahia was at that point the uh, southernmost terminus with the Houston and Texas Central. And you can see the route takes them farther south to Beaumont and then uh, down to Houston. But as it says up here on the caption, uh, the, y, the Y shape would be reversed because as time went on and the road took its form, the Y would be up here in Tig and would go up to uh, Waxahachie and then to Dallas and then shoot the Rock Island from Dallas to Fort Worth. And uh, that also includes the uh, timetable over here through the towns that were being served at the time. And uh, we're about to start getting into a lot of uh, text showing uh, right of ways and things like that and speaking of towns. And so being that this is around the starting date of the Trinity and Brazos Valley, uh, the locomotive segment's going to be more towards the end. But I'm going to start off with this photo showing the number one. And this is... Uh, at, uh, I believe, Southern, Southern Something Iron Company. I have it captioned later on. But uh, this was when uh, TMBV number one and number two were being sold as a batch. They were originally from the B&O and being shipped to Texas for the first two locomotives on this road. And uh, we'll go over the many changes that were done to the locomotive through the modernization of the railroad. And, uh, but just keep this image in your mind that this is somewhat what the time frame looked like as we're going to go through. And... Uh, we're going to hit a few more key points and then we're going to start at Cleburne and work towards TIG. So the Colorado and Southern purchased the TMBV on August 1st, 1905 due to financial issues. Being a director of the Colorado and Southern, B.F. Yoakum was tasked to add trackage to the TMBV. One condition to the deal was that one half of the TMBV was sold to the Rock Island. At this point, 
the TMBV was owned jointly by the Rock Island and the Burlington route, and the Burlington route was a parent company of Colorado and Southern. So there's a lot of politics, a lot of strings that come into play with these things. It's not just one or two simple companies. Companies owned by companies, you know how it is. With outside investors providing funds, the TMBV reached Houston from Mahia in 1907. Waxahachie was reached in 1907 also. Trackage rights were used on the Katy between Waxahachie and Dallas. Trackage rights were used on the Gulf, Colorado and Santa Fe to reach Fort Worth from Cleburne and to reach Galveston from Houston. Trackage rights were used on the Rock Island between Dallas and Fort Worth. And there were other trackage rights involved. We may hit on those later. Uh, the TNBV did have trackage, trackage rights, I believe, when uh, Hewlin was receiver on the uh, Houston, Texas Central uh, that went through Middle Lothian into Fort Worth that way. The TNBV fell into receivership on June 16, 1914. The Katy and the Gulf Colorado and Santa Fe trackage rights were terminated at that time. The receivers in this order were John W. Robbins, L.H. Atwell, and John A. Hewlin. And now from uh, the book, The Bull Weevil, I believe it's sitting on one of these tables back here. I have a copy of it. It's a very informal book, a very important book, and a very vital book to not only the history of this road, but Texas history. And yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to move no. you. Or, <laughs> so they can see the screen a little better. Move and uh, Texas history in general, because the book not only speaks of the road, and uh, I'm sorry. I can't see the screen. The book not only speaks of the road and speaks of other uh, uh, railroad-related things, but it speaks of what the towns in the area look like, what your highways and byways look like at the time, a lot of the culture of the people and the workers, and its first-person point of view because uh, J.L. Allhands was heavily involved with the TNBV from its start. So it's not stories passed down, it's straight from the horse's mouth. So from one of his pages in the book, he says, from his Austin, Texas home, Colonel E.M. House dreamed of constructing a railroad line up through central Texas. He proposed starting in Waco and passing northeast through Prairie Hill on into Mahia. That line would have passed through some of his land holdings, saving a long haul into Hubbard City from his 1100-acre 11 acre farm. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I wish I had some of those rich people problems where I could wonder where I could get a railroad to go through my huge track of land. After the TMBV's October 17, 1902 charter, its leadership body consisted of E.M. House, Chairman of the Board, R.H. Baker, President, J.H.B. House, Vice President, I believe that's Jasper, I haven't found the full name, A. Parker, Secretary and Treasurer, William Malone, Right-of-Way Agent, J. Gorman, Superintendent, and Benjamin Thompson, Chief Engineer. The general contract for bridges and track lane was awarded to the Southern Construction Co uh, Company. By the middle of March 1903, they had 350 teams building the right-of-way. Slopes were cut one-half to one instead of the usual one and one-half to one. Though the foresight in that was to stretch their funds, it proved costly in the maintenance upkeep for several years. 60-pound rails were imported from Germany through Galveston, October 15, 1903, the 26 miles from Hillsborough to Hubbard was opened. And this is located right out here uh, on the, what was the brick plant spur in the late 70s, but was originally the old Fort Worth, Maine. Uh, we have a pipeline right away that we just cleared out there before the switch lead that goes to the brick plant. And this angle bar is located on our uh, right away clearing. So at, it's on FM 1365 out here. You cross the railroad tracks and go west. You make one sharp right turn on the road, it makes another sharp left turn on the road, and you can see the rail and the ties from the road, and you can just get out and walk up there. It was mowed last week, so I don't think you got to worry about chiggers. And this angle bar is located on the, uh, the north side of the right-of-way, on the rails uh, on the north side, and this is facing outside to the north. And uh, it's a really neat piece of history out there. And I haven't got down to look to see if it's 60 or 75 pound rail. I haven't paid too much attention. All I know is it's about this tall. So it's as old as the angle bar. Yes. You might want to get someone to explain that better than me because I've just started looking into the science of that. But it's all about, it, it's, it's, there's a calculation to it. 
about the size and uh, I think a lot of the thickness of the rail and stuff, but we can talk about that afterwards. I'm sure some people here know it better than I do because I've just now started touching. Per yard? Okay. So 60 pounds per yard. Okay. That's easy enough. And uh, here is a TMBV drawing for an angle bar for 75 pound rail. And uh, as you can see, it just bolts both sides of the rail. The boat, bolt goes through the holes in the rail, and that's what joins it long before welded rail came into play like we see nowadays. And this is out there in the woods past the clearing a little bit, and this is some of that small rail on the old Fort Worth, Maine, uh, pointing out towards the west, towards the uh, switch to the brick plant lead. The switch out there that goes to the brick plant uh, still has rails that turn to the left to enter the plant facility under the county road which has been paved over now and the rails stick out in the ditch that's part of the spur to the brick plant so you can see them very visibly right there off the side of the road but the uh, main north of the switch is completely gone they unbolted it from uh, the joints on the, on the uh, west end of the switch and so the switch is just the last element left of the main. Construction continued until Cleburne and Mahia were connected with 78 miles of trackage. Work stopped at Mahia with Boston investors backing out of the project. The earnings of the Cleburne to Mahia line were disappointing. With the main cash crop on the line being cotton, sometime in 1902, the boll weevils began to make their appearance in the cotton squares. The Dallas Commercial Club sponsored boll weevil conferences with mayors of surrounding towns to see what could be done to handle the threat. It was suggested that the nickname of the road be the Bull Weevil by Lewis Mims of the construction company building the TMBV. Now this is the most that I'm going to jump into the Bull Weevil plague because we have so much content to cover, but it was a very dangerous threat to the cotton crop at the time because before we started having all of our clothes made in Indonesia and China, it was right here at home. And so the cotton was very important and when you have insects that's plaguing something that vital, it's a big deal and it was a very big deal if you look at it in the history books. And so now we're going to start seeing a lot more uh, maps and things. And we're going to start right here and uh, go from Cleburne and work our way to TIG. And uh, this bit of blueprints right here, this was later in the game when they renamed it to the Cleburne Branch. Originally it was a Fort Worth, Maine, but whenever the uh, Maine from here to Waxahachie and then on to Dallas took so much traffic and some political strings were pulled that made it have more freight going that way up the Rock Island, uh, they downgraded to the Cleburne branch, and we'll get to that later during the abandonment process. But this is a drawing right here of uh, the roundhouse and the yard area at Cleburne. It's not the whole yard area, but I condensed it down enough to where you could at least see the, the roundhouse and the offices and things. But the TMBV main would have been up here, and it had a spur that came off and came down here to the yard, and they had the car shop and the roundhouse right here on the side of Buffalo Creek. And I can't think of the name of the park, but I want to say these shop facilities is now the uh, site of a park. Does anybody know the name of the park by chance? Well, it's, a, it's maybe a city park or memorial park, but it's something. It's not just woods. And this is a photo taken outside of the Cleburne uh, Santa Fe Depot and the TNBV Depot. And I can't tell if this was taken while the line here was still in service on the uh, Bull Weevil because most pictures you see of the Cleburne Depot, it's long after the rails have been pulled and the boll weevil doesn't service Cleburne anymore. But you can tell up here they had a, uh, looked like some decorative trim hanging down off of the awning. You had the TMBV Heralds, which one of them still survives in a place called the Dillon Depot in Cleburne, and I haven't seen it. I heard it was hanging in a cafe for a while, and uh, I would like to go see it because one of those Heralds still exists. But this is one, probably one of the most common pictures of the depot that people see surfacing online. It's when it was an antique shop, and I want to say it might have had a washeteria joined to it or something like that. But uh, you can notice in this photo that the Herald on this side is gone, but the Herald right here still remains. And this is a painting that I have. I ordered off of uh, eBay. It was a print, print on canvas. And... Uh, it was just a painting, and I, of course you don't see any rails. I don't know if it was a painting when the Brazos uh, was still in service right here. But uh, it's a good painting of the depot. It's the only painting of the depot I've seen. And uh, 
It shows it in really good shape compared to most of the photos you see of it. And that's another picture showing the herald up there on the top, a very clear picture, kind of showing some more of the, uh, the decorative pieces around, like the, the chains going into the brick that was holding the awning, and uh, some of the woodwork under the eaves and things like that. And uh, from that blueprint drawing, here is Cleburne on here, and this is very condensed down, which is good for the photo purposes, but this would have been a lot longer. It's just a very condensed map. But you can see right here, uh, the technical main of the TMBV ends right here, end of tracks. And here's the TMBV depot. And if you were getting on at Cleburne, say, and going north, your train just would have switched off and jumped on the Santa Fe to go to Fort Worth Union Station. And uh, you can see the Y right here, and that Y went to the yards that we just looked at earlier with the roundhouse facility. And one thing you'll notice if you're not keen to reading maps, these little things you see right here reference uh, culverts, small trestles. The longer they are, you can kind of assume it's a trestle if it doesn't have it listed, but that's all your spots where you'd at least have some sort of culvert or bridge. And this is going on now to the, to the southeast, coming out of Cleburne. And uh, we're coming into Parker. And you can see Parker right here had a, uh, a depot, a platform by the depot, a stock pin. And uh, we may have some information later showing if it had a cotton platform. That may be what the platform on the map refers to because just about every one of these towns had a cotton platform. And uh, we'll just keep on heading uh, southeast out of Parker now into Hill County and then we come into Covington. And Covington right here, you can see it had a depot and it had a, a, a siding track that came around the back of the depot off of the main, and it had a stock pin, and it had a platform right here on the curve section, which that probably the curve there looks far more extreme than it probably was because it's a condensed map. And uh, coming on down, I believe it's Osceola. Is that how it's pronounced? Okay. And uh, Osceola, there was a section house, a depot, and uh, a platform by the depot and a stock pin. And uh, now here's the drawing for Covington, a little more detailed, and uh, just the sightings and improvements, which most of the maps we have at the museum are sightings and improvement maps, but they're really good because a lot of things, it's extensions and stuff, and even the stuff that's not extensions, that's where they retired things, they'll still include it on the map, so you can kind of give an idea of what was there even before the abandonment process took place. But you can see right here, it has the platform listed as a cotton platform. And uh, then the depot was right here between the two tracks and uh, had a 57 car capacity on the passing track. And uh, we're going to move on from there. And this is a picture that surfaces online. I've had a few people send it to me. It says this is a Covington depot. And we'll see a freight depot next to the Brick Mahea depot later that has similarities to this. But the amount of tracks, looking at three tracks out here in front of the depot, I haven't found maps to confirm that. So I'm not sure if this is Covington or anything on the TMBV system, but I just threw it in here just in case anyone else has information on it because it holds similarities to the Mahea Freight Depot. And now coming down into Mayfield, we have the depot with a small spur going behind the depot. And as you can tell on the chart right here, it has it listed as everything being 60 pound rail. And I don't have the key with me, but of course your color codes on here is gonna say of what grades of tie plates you have, and your ballast type, and all of those things. And uh, we'll just keep working southeast now out of Mayfield. And we'll come into Hillsboro. And now is where we're going to start seeing some more different maps. These bigger towns have a whole lot more maps and improvement drawings with them versus the smaller towns. And so coming into Hillsboro, um, we come in right here, and it's somewhat of a spider web right here. This is really condensed. You can't tell the detail, but I have plenty of drawings of the interchanges, so we'll be looking at that here in a minute. So coming into the TNBV facilities, there was a depot, a water tank, and there was a decent-sized yard. It was right down there by the Katie's Depot. And so if, to look at this map proper, it's upside down, but the lettering is right side up, so that's why I placed it like this. If you were coming in from, say, TIG, you would be coming in from here. And in a lot of spots in the Hillsboro area, 171, I, at least I know from Bynum, most of the way is on top of the TMBV grade. If you get online and look at Army Corps of Engineer tactical maps, where it shows your, uh, line, your contours for your elevations, 
it will go, and you look at them from the 60s and 70s, it'll show you your 171 highway grade, and it'll also show, show old railroad grade jumping off, so you can see where 171 cut the curves out of the railroad bed and kind of get an idea of what was where. And so, uh, so coming back here to Hillsboro, say this is uh, this will be you coming in from say Cleburne, up here on the TMBV, and you go through and you cross over the uh, the Diamond, cross over the Katy, and right here is the Cotton Belt, and this is the Cotton Belt coming from uh, Corsicana, and it comes yes, ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay, and so this is the Cotton Belt coming in from Corsicana right here, dead ending. And so these are the facilities right here in uh, Hillsboro. The TMBV Depot, I don't see it listed on here, but it was in this area. This may be later because they ended up using the Katy Depot close to the abandonment process. And here's another of Hillsboro. This will be 171 coming in and then running up through here, crossing over to go towards Cleburne. And here's a picture of that tower, that interlocking tower. And this is the boll weevil coming in right here and turning. And this is one of the crossings for one of the spurs off the Katy, one of the drawings, and uh, that's the TMBV main listed right there. And so we're going to do some skipping since time's getting short. Here's uh, Bynum's drawing, and if anyone wants to go back on this PowerPoint later and look at things, uh, I'll be glad to do that, let you borrow the flash drive or whatever, but we're going to do some skipping here. And coming into Malone, there's Malone's interchange with the INGN. A uh, magazine picture of the depot in Malone. This is out of the Bull Weevil. It's really hard to see, but it's early in the days because it's an unmodified 440 of the TMBV. It still has the wood cab and the box headlight. Open vestibule cars, which those are the only pictures of the open vestibule cars that I've seen on the uh, Valley Road, which is another nickname of the TMBV. And uh, you can see here William Malone was given uh, 150 a month. Uh, allowance for a wall telephone. And coming into Hubbard right here, we have the interchange with the Cotton Belt. And the TMBV backed into Hubbard into the depot. It didn't have any main line that had a depot on it. It had to go through across the uh, diamond with the Cotton Belt and then back into town. And there's another picture of the interchange right there with the Cotton Belt. And there's the depot right up here in the depot grounds and the lots that belong to the railroad. And that's a picture of it right there. So since that depot was on uh, that side of the tracks, this locomotive would be facing the dead end. There's a, a magazine picture of the depot. And so coming now, we're coming down into Munger. And right here at Munger, there was uh, a small station, uh, the store off the side of the road, and of course, cotton platform. And this is a, a concrete box culvert outside of Munger that still exists. Now coming into Coolidge, before you get to town, coming from the west, there's a 1909 uh, arch culvert. And then this is an old drawing of the Coolidge Depot. And if you look at it close, especially the bay window, the depot's gone over many modifications over the years. And inside the depot in the freight room, the, the depot serves as a city office, but they have a few things like some drawings hanging for people to come look at. And uh, it had gas installed in 1929. There's a picture of the depot as it is currently. I've been in it many times. It's a very clean kept building. And uh, that would have been for an oil company or something back in the day that sold oil or petroleum products. And I'm pretty sure that dates to the railroad days. There's another one building just like that sitting off 171 in Malone. And now coming into Datura and Tawakini, uh, we'll start seeing some drawings of it. It's proof of depot facilities in Datura. And here's the drawing of Tawakini. There was a depot, a cotton platform, a section house, a water tank, and a pump house from a pond they had over there to the left. And uh, we don't have time to read these, but that's just talking about moving equipment and things. Um, here is out in the woods where on the maps I've been able to walk out and pretty much pinpoint where the Tawakini depot was. And I believe that that is the foundation for the chimney that would have been in the depot. And this is looking along the TMBV grade, looking west. It's directly on top of the county road here. And the depot would be right over here in the woods to the right. I want to see the ponds that were just off the map are over here to the right. In the wintertime, you can see the right-of-way very clearly across the other side of 171. 
and I believe the water tank and uh, the pump house could have been absorbed by 171. And the overpass that you can still drive on the old portion of 171 looks like it was installed in 1929. And here's a picture of that overpass. I'll get through it pretty quick, but it still has the reflectors on the ends, mostly intact. The picture doesn't do it justice. It's a very long way to the road grade under the underpass. It's very tall. And here's proof of the, uh, the Mahia Quarry Company having a siding at Tawakney. And it was a pretty long spur. I have the drawing of it in the museum. I wasn't able to get a picture of it, but there was a fairly long spur to the Quarry Company. Now, coming into Mahia from the west, we have uh, lots of things going on here. You can see on this Limestone County map, the TNBV snaking in from the west and coming into Mahia from the northwest, crossing and then going out towards Holden and Tig. And here's a map of the oil field. This was all the drilling, and this was all the storage in this area. There was more storage in Holden just off the map where the big oil tanks would have been. And this zooming in, the valley road went right through where the drilling was. There's pictures around, uh, captioned tall timber on the bull weevil, and you can see a TMBV train going through a bunch of derricks in a scene like this. And I believe it was in that area. And this is the golden lane where the most drilling was going on. A lot of the businesses were set up for the oil companies in Mahia. The tank cars that would have had the oil picking up from the storage facilities. And uh, we'll skip through some of the text because we need to look at these pictures since we're tight on time. But here's a good aerial of Mahia. The TMBV Depot is right here. And this is the park for the brick Houston and Texas Central Depot. And then the wood Houston and Texas Central Freight Depot, which I'm pretty sure was used as a passenger depot until the brick was built. And here uh, is a good aerial from the back, from the north side of the overpass. And I think this predates 1942 because that's when the line was abandoned from Coolidge to Mahia. And you can see here uh, gondola cars with white rock and uh, crushed stone and things in them. And that, I believe, came from the quarry company lead up towards Tawakony. And this is as that scene looks today. And this is the original plaque. The overpass was replaced, but this plaque... Uh, that was on the original is in the city park in Mahia on display. And it mentions the Burlington Rock Island because at that time it was already reorganized when the overpass was built. And here's a Sanborn map drawing of Mahia and there's the TMBV depot off of uh, Preston. And there's another of the depot again there to the right. And this is showing the interchange between the Houston and Texas Central and the TMBV. They had two. They had one here in the, that's the Y, and then they had the transfer track right here. And here's just a write-up uh, from a magazine or some old article, possibly the newspaper. I got this from the uh, newspaper in Mahia, and just speaking of the two depots. And here's a good picture of the brick depot that was in Mahia for the TMBV. And here's the wooden uh, freight house, and I've seen it on the drawings listed as freight house, so I know it was owned by the railroad. And it's really similar to the one we looked at for Covington earlier. That's the only thing that makes me ring a bell and think that Covington picture could possibly be something to do with the boll weevil, but possibly not for Covington. And here's the locations today as they look. The foundation for the Houston and Texas Central Depot is still there visible. And the brick depot is completely gone where it originally was here off of Preston. But what remains is the agent's office that, was, uh, that replaced that depot. And here's a good photo of it from maybe 30-something years ago. And I don't know if this is original or repainted, but here's how it looks today. It's still there. It's grown up. The wooden freight door is still intact. You can still make out the Burlington Route Heralds as well as the Rock Island Heralds on some of the corners of the building. And it's in various states of disrepair. One corner is knocked down fairly good from a tree falling on it, but it's surrounded and guarded by rail that was put there for blocks back in the day. And there's where the main line would have crossed Preston, or run along Preston right there. 
and uh, some of the wood is still visible. Some of the rails are still visible by Encore, which is on the other side of the little agent's office. And there's some of the ballast that would have been used, a mixture of crushed shell and some other rock that's out there on the right of way in the woods. And this right north of the overpass on the right of way turning before 14, there's a 1914 culvert still existing in the woods. And uh, we'll skip on over some of the text. The last picture was Tower 63. It's all in your uh, booklets. And uh, we'll have to skip the text because of the time. But this is coming out of Tower 63. This is where the grain elevator is now that I'm sure everybody knows about because it's still standing. But the track alignment predates the grain elevator. Originally, it was just for the storage facility out here. You can see the, the grain elevator would have been right here between these two tracks. And when all this was ripped out, the grain elevator replaced it. And you can see some cars stored out here. And uh, this is going back towards TIG uh, this way. And so right now we're getting into Freestone County. We're coming into a small community called Limestone, which shows up on the maps, which is odd because Point Enterprise never showed up on the railroad maps as having a depot or a siding. And it's a community that's lived in today. But Limestone shows to have a siding, a section house, bunkhouse, and uh, other maps show it to have a fairly large platform. And it shows up on all the railroad maps. And this is uh, out here off of, I believe, County Road 900. And it's one of the surviving trestles from the TNBV, maybe one of the only ones that still stands to its height, complete height. And I haven't found any date nails on it, but I've looked. And it's no telling when it'll fall, but it's standing today. And so now we're coming into TIG with 75 pound rail. We'll have to skip the text here. And so this is a depot here in TIG. This would be uh, the TMBV number one that we looked at earlier coming in from the south. And if you'll notice, it's already gone under many modifications. It has a taller cab that's made of steel. The box headlight was replaced with the arc style headlight and the smoke box was uh, shortened back and it has a new front on the smoke box with a different door. And this is uh, taken from an aerial looking at the depot here and you can see uh, where the track curved and went over here towards Cleburne, south to Houston and then north to Waxahachie this way. And this was taken off the top of the coal chute. And this is out front of the depot just showing one of the many coaches which just about all the coaches were identical on the uh, TNBV. They all had the stained glass arches, were all wood. I'm sure they had coal stoves. And this is inside the office buildings, just showing some of the guys at work. And uh, if y'all know where this artifact is, let me know, please. I'd love, to, I'd love to touch it. I have no idea what year this is. This picture wasn't dated, but looking at the calendar up here, I'd say 1913. September of 13, unless they're like me and they're lazy to change the calendar date. <laughs> and this is out here showing the yard facilities at TIG, the roundhouse, and uh, this would have been later on after 1907 because the locomotives you see are uh, 280 consolidations and they're of the larger ones bought uh, after Yoakum's funding came in. And so that dates this picture around or after 1907. And here's another picture of the yard facilities looks like the cinder pit right here. The coal chute, the picture was taken off earlier, is right here. The roundhouse, the water tower, the boiler machine shops here in the back, and then the tank used to fill the locomotives with oil. And I don't have the drawing provided on this uh, presentation, but the oil tank here, gravity fed off of a line to a oil storage tank behind the roundhouse. We have the drawings of it to prove that. And here's the drawing of the coal chute. I want to say this is TIG, but I'm not sure because Waxahachie had one as well because the name has been covered up and I wasn't able to see it. We'll go skip through this text. And here's Main Street of TIG, how it would have looked around that time with the road being built. Horse and buggies, very boggy, dirt. This right here is the yard office that used to be on the front of the freight station that was out here. And the yard office was later moved across from the depot here as shown in other photos. And here is a nice aerial view from the coal chute. It was a long fish eye lens photo I was able to cut up. So this is off the same photo as earlier. 
And this is another view of the oil tank used to fill the locomotives. And these are various types of cars and things that were used on the road. Box cars converted into work cars, narrow side doors put on, windows cut through. And here's the freight depot. And this is after the yard office was moved because in the earlier aerial, one of the wood buildings across from the depot was originally right there like we saw in the last photo. We'll see it again good in a photo here in a minute. This is just another part of that aerial showing the, the side door caboose that was used by the uh, TMBV and then later the Burlington Rock Island until outside cabooses were surfaced in like Fort Worth and Denver cabooses. And here's showing the yard and this, the aerial was dated 1910. And so I believe a lot of these locomotives might not have even been used yet, might have been part of the 1907 order batch because look at how shiny the steam domes and the sand domes are on these locomotives and they're very new and they're all identical in a line. I think it's a new batch, but there's no text to prove that. And here's what I was talking about. Here's the freight house and here's the yard office that was later moved across from the depot. And a lot of people remember a big long platform that was on the end of that freight house and that originally housed the yard office. But you can see here locomotives like the 33 and some of the other smaller ones, the 260s, the 460s are out here hanging out around the yard facilities. And here's the oil tank that gravity fed the smaller oil tank right here that filled the locomotives. And here's another picture of the yard facilities. Here's the oil tank right here and uh, just lots of construction and work going on very early in the day as you'll notice because this locomotive hasn't been altered it still has the box headlight and the wood cab so that dates this as a very early photo another picture of the yard facilities and here's a good aerial view of TIG and I want to say this by looking at the cars at some time in the 30s or 40s but I find it relevant for this because it's a good aerial view of the roundhouse the oil tank, the water tower, and then the machine shops, as well as the depot. And here's a top drawing of, uh, from an improvement drawing of the roundhouse, just showing that it was a 10-stall roundhouse. And uh, here's the 39. This is from a collection of negatives I have from uh, Earl Turnham, and it's outside the roundhouse. From that collection as well, the, the negatives didn't have any text. There's no names for these. But this man largely resembles a hipple, and a few of you might know the hipples I'm talking about. And there's another good picture of the oil tank filled with locomotives. And then here's some of the maintenance away track cars that would have been used on the TMBV. A downtown uh, Main Street view of TIG. Not long after that time, probably in the 20s, judging by the vehicles. And then here's outside of the depot. This is one of the new batches of the 460s bought around 07. This is the 51 by looking at the number board up there on the headlight out here on the uh, Fort Worth lead coming up from the depot. And this is right out here across from the depot, maybe just a handful of steps to the south. And it's a 1917 uh, dated uh, box culvert. And this is how some of the earth moving and the grading camps look. This was taken from photos from the, the book, The Bull Weevil. Just showing how a lot of these men were really used to blood, sweat, and tears because of how crude some of the camps looked and uh, how hard some of the work looked that was being done. It was all graded by mules and oxen and whatever equipment could be hauled behind them. And you'll see text talking about an elevated grader, and I haven't researched it yet, but what I can look at it from, it has a conveyor, it looks like, that comes off the side, and that may be the elevation that they're referring to, because it dumps the spoil out on the outside of the uh, grading area. There's another photo of the elevating grader. And there's the what I believe is a conveyor, or something designed as a conveyor, loading the wagons coming from the grader over here. There's more grading work done, very primitive. And here's a drawing of some of the bridge work done on the TMBV. And of course it's possible to find where these bridges are because it looks like they use station numbers, or what I'm used to in gas company lingo is station plus numbers. I think it runs about the same. And you could, I'm sure, decipher those with mile posts and things to find where the bridges actually were or still are. And here's some of the covered bridges that were on there, the overhead bridges on the TMBV. And to show you an example of that still exists, and I'm sure lots of you know about it, is the Blue Cut Road Bridge. 
up in the McGregor area, and it's still standing today, and it resembles the designs that would have been used around that time. And so getting into the, uh, how much more time do I have? Five minutes? Okay. Let's dip into the locomotives a little bit because everybody likes the locomotives. All right, so here's the TMBV number one. And uh, some of this information is coming from the, the book, The Colorado Road. And it's by F. Hall Wagner, Jr. And it's a very good book, very informal. goes very in-depth on the locomotives, where they went, where they came from. And then there's the number one after all its changes. The smoke box being shortened down. The arc headlight being installed. The steel cab being installed. And numerous changes to plumbing and things that we won't get into. But steam locomotives were probably replumbed 100 times in their life. And here's the number one outside of the roundhouse with some of the shop crew on it. 1910. If you'll notice, even in 1910, you can picture out all the busted windows and things around the shop. So maybe some people were disgruntled. Maybe some wrenches flew. Who knows? <laughs> And here's the number two, which is identical to the number one. And I don't have time to read through the text, but they were bought as a batch from the B, uh, they came from the B&O, but they were bought from the Southern Iron Equipment Company in Atlanta. And there's the number two, heavily modified like the number one, and walks a hatchie under the, uh, under the inner urban. The steel cab, the shortened smoke box, the arc headlight, many other changes. And there's the number two at the shop also, with some of the shop force on her. And here's the back of the number two, and you can see she has a very tall, narrow oil bunker. And there's a, a steel cab. She has many toolboxes on there. And then here's the number three, which the number three was another batch of 440s bought that were slightly different. And uh, I don't know if they were as delivered in this state or not. And then here's the number five, one of the 260s, and she's on uh, pile driver duty. And if you... Uh, Look it up in research, and it says in this book, too, this pile driver lasted here in the yards, I want to say, through the 60s. And then here's the 16, which was uh, one of the early 280s that was sent to the road. Most of the locomotives were secondhand up until Yoakum got in and had funding to order some new locomotive batches that lasted until the 1930 reorganization. But this would have been another hand-me-down locomotive and uh, just on the work train duty. And then here's the 25... This is one photo that I have. This is another photo out of the bull weevil showing both sides of her in the deadline. She was a hand-me-down locomotive as well. And then here's the 30. The 30 was part of a batch sent from the Fort Worth and Denver. You can identify that largely just by the design of the wagon top boiler and by the design of the arches on the windows. They were very distinctive from the Fort Worth and Denver. And then here's the 30 again, tied up with a collision, which the more you research this road, the more you see it had a lot of wrecks. And then here's the 31 down at what I believe is Houston, and very beautiful locomotive, very well-proportioned locomotive, very clean. And then here's her demise in the picture probably everybody has seen in uh, the 31 and 33 at Honey Springs on uh, joint Katy Traggage in 1908. And what just baffles me, and it's just one of those unexplainable things, you have all this damage, the cab slid forward, but look at those gauges. They don't look like they got touched. And then here's the 32, which would have been some of the new batches of the 280s ordered. And this is after the reorganization when she was relettered to the Burlington Rock Island with the barrel style, either Golden Glow, Powell National, who knows, headlight that replaced the original arc. You'll notice she doesn't have the wooden cow catcher anymore like the other locomotives had. She's now been reduced to footboards for more switcher duty. But the odd thing was is the 460s of this new batch were ordered with the compound cylinders where you'll have another one of these right here, but these have the older style slide valves. And then here's the 37, another one of the batches at the 280s at Waxahachie, working the local duty. And here's the write-up on it for the Waxahachie local with the names and whatnot. And then here's another picture of the 37 after she was changed over during the reorganization. She's re-lettered, she has a different headlight, and uh, she still has her wooden pilot compared to the 32 that we looked at a while ago. And then here's the 40. The 40, they would have all been identical as delivered. So the 40 has now been reduced to footboards, the different headlight, and the relettering and other things. Some of the jacketing removed around the firebox. And then here's the 43 down in Houston. And it's an odd thing to me because this is the only photo I've ever seen of a TMBV locomotive hooked up to a caboose other than a blind inside door caboose. 
It's Fort Worth and Denver caboose, it looks like. And then here's the 47 taking control of the Zephyr after the locomotive broke down outside of, uh, I believe it's Houston. And then here's the 50, which is one of my favorite pictures. I don't know if this is as delivered or spruced up for a special event, but this is the only photo I've seen of a locomotive from the Bull Weevil that's spruced up with white wall wheels. It looks like she, if, unless it's the glare from the gloss, it may have white, uh, the white on the front of the cow catcher. You can notice they all have the Valley Roads Herald up there on the cab, very small, and just a beautiful, well-proportioned locomotive. And then there's the 50 after she was uh, reduced down to the Burlington Rock Island standards with the re-lettering, some of the jacketing removed, so a lot of the plumbing changed. You notice she has a Powell National headlight that has the, uh, the number boards flared out, similar to the 30 at the Texas State Railroad, but she's still sporting her wooden pilot for now. And then there's the uh, 51 right here at TIG, the picture we looked at earlier, and I put it here again for comparison. Here's a 51 again on a postcard that's widely known down at uh, Waxahachie. And then here's the 51 after uh, being relettered to the Burlington Rock Island. The different headlight still has the wood pilot, different lettering. And then here's the 54, which is a batch from the St. Louis, Brownsville, and Mexico sent up by Yoakum. And uh, that's about all the time I have. So if anybody wants to see any of the rest of the PowerPoint, let me know.